I'm Christopher Clark, Cambridge historian. I was born in Australia. For Europeans, that's practically the other end of the world. But the European continent and its incredible diversity always fascinated me. Even in the far off country where I grew up, I was always aware that so much of our world has its roots in Europe. And modern Europe is one of the greatest achievements in human history. I want to share the grand saga of this continent. And in the process, I hope to rediscover its wonders for myself. This doesn't look European at all, you might say. But there's also an Oriental Europe, and that's what I'm looking for here in Istanbul. Istanbul is the only major city in the world that straddles two continents, the European and the Asian, on which I'm standing here. And between them, the Bosphorus, one of the world's most strategically sensitive waterways. The geography is straightforward enough, but where Europe begins and where it ends is also a question of religion. Today, it's fashionable to define Europe in terms of a Western Judeo-Christian tradition, and yet the origins of this tradition lie outside Europe, in the Middle East, in Palestine, Syria, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. And Paul, the most important of the early Christian missionaries, came from Tarsus in today's Turkey. And this place too, Constantinople, Today, Istanbul once shaped the Christian culture of Europe. I'm in Istanbul in the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom that has stood on this spot for 1,500 years. Before the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, this was the largest Christian church in the world, and Constantinople was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, the cultural heart of Europe. When the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in 1453, the Hagia Sophia became a mosque. But the 11th century mosaics still remain as a testimony to the era of Christendom. Today, this building is mainly a museum, although parts of it are once again in use as a mosque. In this place, we can clearly see how similar these religions actually are and which sources they draw from. Nowhere else were the power of the Roman emperors and the authority of the Christian church as tightly intertwined as in this immense structure. When the Ottomans conquered Constantinople in 1453, Sultan Mehmet II marked the victory by riding into the church and conducting the Muslim Friday prayer. The Hagia Sophia became a mosque and it remained one until 1935 when it was redesignated as a museum. But today, things are changing. The call to prayer of the Moezin again rings out from the four minarets, and an imam has recently been appointed. Important historical buildings like this one have always been put to political use, and that instrumentalization continues today. The central themes of the Mosaic Bible and the Christian New Testament can nearly all be traced back to sources in Mesopotamia, Asia Minor, and the Levant. Moses' Ten Commandments, for example, probably have their origins in ethical injunctions he encountered in Egypt. And the notion that the soul is immortal and that a divine judgment awaits the dead could also be found in the kingdom of the pharaohs. Christianity, that central strand of the continent's history, was not a European invention. What gave Christianity the power to unite Europe over and over again? Part of the answer can be found in the New Testament, in the book known as Apostles. Having once himself mercilessly persecuted the Christians, Paul, a Greek Jew from Tarsus, becomes a fervent believer in the teachings of Christ. Forgiveness and benevolence are the key to the kingdom of heaven, he preaches, just as Jesus revealed. He presses against the prevailing mentality of the time. He favors forgiveness over condemnation, mercy over revenge. His message is that God is there for everyone, even the poor and downtrodden, and Paul practices what he preaches. On his journeys, he leads by example, standing up for the weak.
Paul travelled many thousands of kilometres on roads like these, or more often, on rough terrain or even by boat. And in the process, he'd laid the foundations for a global church, because Paul's Christianity was an offer to everyone. Initially, to be sure, it was above all the poor and the weak who responded to his call. But the brothers and sisters in the faith stuck together. Some were even prepared to die for their religion, an act of witness that was not lost on all of their contemporaries. What began as a movement of underdogs is today, with 2.3 billion members, the largest faith community in the world. But the rise of Christianity doesn't begin in Jerusalem. It starts in York, England. This is where Constantine the Great is named Roman Emperor in the year 306, or rather Quarter Emperor. At this point, the empire is divided up between four emperors. They don't rule from Rome, but from modern-day Milan, Trier, Sirmium, and Izmit. Why is it Constantine, of all people, who helps Christianity become an established major religion? Where is my mother? Over there, my lord. Behind every powerful man is a strong woman, they used to say. And in such cases, a mother can be especially influential. Helena, Constantine's mother, is a fine example. While Constantine primarily views Christianity as a means to power, Helena is baptized. She is a true believer in the superiority of the Christian God. It is likely Constantine's mother who familiarizes the emperor with the new religion, ushering in a new era for Europe. She would later be canonized by the church. And then, before a decisive battle, legend has it that Constantine receives a vision. God tells him that he should go into battle marked with the sign of Christ, that it will help him defeat his enemies. At the time, Constantine was anything but a conventional Christian. It isn't until many years later, just before his death, that he resolves to be baptized. But Constantine extends his autocratic rule under the banner of Christianity, and the Christogram becomes his trademark. His struggle for power is the first religious war, the first crusade, and the beginning of a fateful alliance between the church and the state that will last into Europe's modern era. At the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, as depicted by Renaissance painter Raphael, Constantine I defeats his rival Maxentius to become sole ruler. He believes that God has granted him this victory, and in gratitude, he launches the process of Christianizing the Roman Empire. Constantine celebrates his victory over his rivals with a triumphal procession in the year 312. Like Caesar, who saw himself as a demigod, Constantine parades towards the Temple of Jupiter, but under a Christian banner. However, unlike his hero, Constantine symbolically turns around when he's halfway to the temple. Halt! Turn around. But, but my emperor. Turn around. Now. The crowd isn't expecting this, and they boo him as he rides away. It's a good visual representation of what would come to be called the Constantinian shift. Christianity is becoming more and more influential, and half a century later, it will become the official religion. But what were the reasons for the success of Christianity? Well, first there's the fact that the alliance of the church with the powerful Roman imperial state greatly increased its appeal. The church was open to anyone who wanted to join. This had never been the case with the Jews. Then there was the Christian belief in deliverance and salvation in the hereafter. Death was no longer final. For those who'd endured a great deal of suffering in their lives, this was a powerful and attractive argument. It seemed that what Jesus had promised them was something the many heathen gods they'd worshipped up till now simply couldn't offer. The Christian church could even forgive sins in the name of Jesus, something that would have seemed very strange to the Apostle Paul. 
According to the old Jewish tradition, the forgiveness of sins was something reserved to God and the last judgment. The emperor commissions the construction of the Arch of Constantine in Rome to mark this major victory. It's a symbol of his claim to power. Constantine adorned his claim to power with Christian symbols, portraying the events and decisions of his reign as expressions of God's will. It's an invincible combination. We can see here the roots of the religiously sanctioned violence that in later centuries would scar the history of Europe and its global expansion. In the year 324, Constantine the Great turns his back on Rome forever. He heads to the Bosporus, to Byzantium, where he constructs his new capital, Constantinople, today known as Istanbul. It becomes the center of Christian culture, outshining even Rome. Where today the skyline is dominated by minarets, Constantine and his successors built churches. He wanted Christ Pantocrator, ruler of the world, to radiate from this city to the rest of Europe as the mosaics and paintings in the Cora church indicate. Back then, the actual heart of Christendom was not in Rome, but in the east of Europe. But what became of Rome, that eternal city where everything supposedly began, ravaged by the raids of Germanic tribes from the fifth century onwards? And Rome, the former world metropolis, fell into decline and decay. Ruins everywhere. What didn't decline with ancient Rome was Roman Christianity. The Germanic tribal leaders accepted and adopted the faith, albeit in a somewhat simplified form. And so the Germans in Rome became Roman Christians and thereby heirs to the Roman imperial heritage. A profound rupture and at the same time, a deep continuity. In the history of Europe, this is not a contradiction. And at the other end of the continent, far to the west, it's Ireland of all places, that emerald isle at the outer edge of Europe, never conquered by the Romans, that becomes one of the most important starting points for the process of Christianization. Irish missionaries begin to find their way into other countries as early as the sixth century. But why does it all start in Ireland? Here in Ireland is where Christianity and the nature-worshipping faith of the Celts meet. The Book of Kells, a true treasure of the Middle Ages, is a good example of the way these two religions crossed paths. Filled with images of nature, it blends traditional Celtic motifs with Christian symbols. It was this distinctive mix, the simplicity and the credibility of a religion that had not yet drifted too far from its heathen roots that gave Irish Christianity its special appeal. And Irish monasteries were special in another respect as well. They were open to young people who wished to study without necessarily becoming monks or nuns. And this open traffic between the cloister and the world beyond was another important feature of early Irish Christianity. It all starts in the fourth century with a monk named Patrick, the son of a Roman officer from Britannia. He is considered the apostle of Ireland. At the time, Ireland is still a land of Druids and pagans. According to legend, Patrick starts a fire on the Hill of Slain at Easter in the year 433. The fire is larger, and burns longer than the one set by his pagan opponents on the Hill of Tara, an ancient Celtic ritual site across the valley. And that is Patrick's strategy in a nutshell. Ireland's patron saint wins people over with simple signs and symbols, feeding their spiritual hunger and helping them become devout Christians. He explained the Trinity, for example, with the help of a clover leaf, father, son, and Holy Spirit. Today, the clover leaf is the national symbol of the Irish, an icon like St. Patrick himself. Monasteries like Clonmacnoise served as an incubator for this fledgling religious faith in Ireland. 
St. Patrick was clever enough not to contradict the prevailing social order or act against the clans in the country. He imported the Roman alphabet and helped to ensure that the Celtic traditions were recorded in writing. In order to understand the expansiveness of Irish religion, the scope of its influence across Western Europe, we need to remember another peculiarity of the Irish monks, namely the Peregrinatio Pro Christo, the pilgrimage for Christ, which was not a journey to a specific sacred location, but a protracted exile of wandering, in which the monks took upon themselves the risks and privations of early medieval travel as a kind of penance, a form of martyrdom. Far from their beloved country, their language and their kinship groups, a form of ascetic piety without which the course of the spread of Christianity in Europe might have been very different. In the 6th century, the monks Columbanus and Gallus gather ten of their religious brothers around them in remembrance of the Twelve Apostles. The walking stick, the symbol of pilgrims, becomes their trademark. They set out to convert their European neighbors on the continent. For them, all of life is a pilgrimage. The Irish monks bring Christianity to Gallia, modern-day Switzerland, to Italy, to Galicia, and later to places as far off as Iceland. Monasteries are established throughout the continent, creating a tight-knit Christian network. Columbanus is responsible for the establishment of over 300 monasteries in the Frankish Empire alone. The missionary is memorialized in Luxeuil, in the Vosges region of France. When Columbanus and Gallus encounter pagan ritual sites, their radical side rears its head. They invoke the Old Testament, which reads, you must tear down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars. There is much for us to do here, Gallus. In the name of God, our Holy Father. missionary efforts of the Irish monks have a lasting effect. In fact, Columbanus and Gallus were the ones who brought church bells to the continent, which still call the faithful to worship today. Welcome. And growing numbers of pagans to convert to Christianity. During the migration period and the various invasions of the Roman Empire, many state structures collapsed. The only force that was still capable of creating and maintaining a certain degree of order was Christianity. It wasn't just a matter of belief. The church became an organizing force in the life of the people, steadily expanding its power and its moral authority. Between the 6th and the 10th centuries, this melding of Roman and Germanic elements created something entirely new. Monasteries now become the nucleus of Christian culture in Europe. Gallus settles near Lake Constance in modern-day Switzerland. The city of St. Gallen is named after him. Here, hundreds of years later, a monastery is constructed over his grave. Today, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And the monasteries shape more than just people's faith. Their libraries are the new centers of knowledge in Europe. The ancient wisdom of the Greeks and Romans is also preserved here, although the prevailing mindset of the era would label its authors pagans. The old works are carried over into a new age. It was like a salvage operation for world cultural heritage. Respect for the traditions and knowledge of previous generations would become a defining characteristic of European culture. This is how monasteries and churches become the focal points of European civilization in the Middle Ages. And because they are at the center of cities and villages on the continent, they also shape the landscape. 
They may come in different shapes and sizes, but church spires are always a defining feature of Europe. Even today, the influence of Christianity can be felt throughout Europe, including here in Reims. Over the centuries, so many creations, from music and literature to the incredible architecture of the churches, were inspired by a desire to praise God. Reims, with its famous cathedral, could be called the birthplace of a Christian Europe. This is where Clovis, king of the Franks and founder of the Merovingian dynasty, was baptized as a reward for defeating the tribe of the Alemanni. Legend has it that during the decisive battle, he cried out, Jesus Christ, if you give me victory over these enemies, I will believe in you and will be baptized in your name. Very much like Emperor Constantine in ancient Rome, another case of the powerful falling back on religion for support. Clovis allied himself with the influential Roman Catholic Church, a decisive step that enabled the Frankish rulers over time to merge with their Gallo-Roman subjects. This solemn baptism on Christmas Day in the year 500 left a lasting impression on the people of the day. 3,000 warriors decided to be baptized alongside Clovis, prefiguring the eventual conversion of the entire Frankish people to the Christian faith. Clovis's conversion laid the spiritual foundations for Charlemagne's immense empire and for a Christian Europe. Naturally, Clovis's successors also expand their power as they spread the Christian religion. Charlemagne is particularly ruthless. He ignores the Christian message of brotherly love, deciding to focus instead on conversion by the sword. Thousands die as a result. The Saxons suffer most for their resistance to Charlemagne, who uses extreme violence to bring them to heel. They are forced to convert to Christianity. But for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire, broad swathes of Western Europe are unified and even share the same faith. The Frankish Empire would later become France, Germany, and the Benelux countries, the core countries of the modern-day European Union. EU officials seem to have learned a thing or two from Charlemagne. The emperor enacted Europe's first agricultural regulations, which dictated the medicinal and crop plants that could be farmed in his empire, as well as the standards of quality those plants had to meet. These regulations were strictly enforced at the empire's markets. There were also standardized units of weight and a standard currency, the denarius, or Charlemagne penny. How much for all? Just one denarius. The denarius is used as currency in France and beyond, even in England. Europe had an economic and monetary union of sorts 1,200 years before the introduction of the euro. It's no wonder that Charlemagne is celebrated as the father of Europe today. His capital, Aachen, is considered the Rome of the North. Art and culture reach a new peak under Charlemagne, earning this era the name Carolingian Renaissance. Charlemagne brings scholars from all over Europe to his court, and his court school becomes the heart of education on the continent, bringing forth new ideas in poetry, theology, and historiography. A collective memory is born. Charlemagne makes the ancient world accessible to the Germanic peoples. The writing system also develops during this period. The Carolingian minuscule forms the basis for the Times New Roman font that we still use today. Charlemagne's power politics, with all the associated crusades and conquests, helped the Frankish Empire become a global power, the likes of which hadn't been seen since the fall of Western Rome.
Aachen, with its magnificent imperial palace, was Charlemagne's main place of residence, but the emperor was always on the move, keeping a firm grip on the far-flung territories of his empire. Whenever he was home, he enjoyed the local culture and luxuries, including the hot springs. He specifically built his imperial palace across from a Roman bath. The foundation and scale of today's Aachen City Hall are identical to the former royal residence. This is where all the royal feasts and coronations were held. The octagonal Aachen Cathedral is another famous Carolingian landmark. The architects of the age clearly drew on Byzantine art in their designs. The focal point is the marble throne. The ruler who sits here has nothing above him but the heavens, and below him are his people. But Charlemagne wants to be more than just king of the Franks. He has bigger plans. He hopes to secure lasting power for the Frankish people. In autumn of the year 800, he crosses the Alps to Rome with a large procession in tow. His destination is old St. Peter's Basilica, which once stood where the dome of the cathedral rises above the city today. The Pope would crown him emperor here on Christmas Day, a spectacle of historic proportions. Charlemagne wears the crimson robes of the ancient Roman emperors. A ruler of a Germanic tribe takes up the mantle of the Roman rulers and becomes the founder of the Western European medieval empire. The emperor swears an oath to restore the Roman empire and to protect the Holy Roman Church. In the centuries to come, the Holy Roman Emperors will continue to be crowned here. But the Franks are not the only ones spreading their faith at sword point across Europe. The Christian West was on the rise in the Middle Ages, but so was the Islamic West. In April 711, the Muslim Moors of North Africa land on the southern tip of Spain. Within seven years, they've conquered almost the entire Iberian Peninsula. The invaders cross the Pyrenees and advance deep into France, reaching as far as Tours. The Franks call on the Europeans to fight back and stop the invaders. Charles Martel, an experienced strategist, serves as the military leader of the Franks, Lombards and Aquitanians. The Arab warriors are feared. In recent decades, they have conquered the Middle East and North Africa. But Charles Martel's men have sworn to hold the line at all costs. They repel the invaders, and the battle is later exalted as a fight for Europe itself. On the Iberian Peninsula, the Moors hold their ground and established the Islamic Empire of Al-Andalus, which would shape the southwest of Europe for nearly 800 years. As the capital city, Cordoba begins to expand. By the end of the millennium, this home of the caliphs is the most important metropolis in the Western world, a mega city with half a million residents. The mosque the Moors construct on the ruins of a Roman temple and a Christian church is the largest house of worship in the world at the time. Today, it's a Christian cathedral once again. That's Europe for you, always this back and forth. Does Islam belong in Europe? Well, it's certainly part of the history of the European continent, and at times it's been a deeply important part of that history. Islamic medieval Spain became the conduit between Western Europe and the great academies of the Middle East. In centers of learning like Baghdad, Muslim scholars were pushing back the horizons of knowledge. It's not just that scholars in the Arabic tradition translated and analyzed important works from ancient Greek and thereby preserved them for the West. Muslim scientists also engaged in experimental research, even citing passages in the Quran that called upon the faithful to observe nature as a divine sign. 
and to obtain knowledge. An Islamic renaissance began. Biology, zoology, geography, optometry, medicine, astronomy, and mathematics all boomed. And this new knowledge was also taught in the Muslim universities of Spain, which were attended by Jewish and Catholic students, including the man who would later become Pope Sylvester II. And this is how the expertise of the Arab world came to the European continent. For nearly a millennium, Islam was a culturally decisive force in Europe. The Alhambra in Granada is an eloquent expression of that fact. The Caliph's open-minded, cosmopolitan attitude attracts scholars from all over Europe and the Middle East. And as a result, something incredible happens here in the south of the continent. Muslim, Jewish and Christian scholars launch what one might call a joint research project. Jewish scholars helped to translate the ancient writings collected and translated by the Arabs, including works by Aristotle, into Latin, making them accessible to Christian Europe and preserving them for generations to come. Even back then, it was clear that cooperation between the Arabic and Hebraic cultures could be extremely productive. It seems that we still have something to learn from the golden age of Al-Andalus. So Europe definitely benefited from Muslim rule over the Iberian Peninsula, and the European zest for research through experimentation likely had its roots in this era. But then it all came to a very sudden end. The Alhambra in Granada was the last bastion of the Moors in Spain. In 1492, the last of the emirs to rule in this magnificent fortress was obliged to surrender the key to the Queen of Spain, Isabella of Castile. The Moors were promised freedom of religion by the ruling Spaniards, but this tolerance was soon replaced by religious zealotry. The First Crusade had sown a spirit of conquest and persecution throughout Europe. Pope Urban II fired the starting shot from Clermont in the French Auvergne when he convened a synod against immorality and faithlessness and called on the faithful to arm themselves and travel to Jerusalem. It had become increasingly difficult to access the holy sites there Deus lo volt, it is God's will, Pope Urban declared, and thousands followed his call, nobles, knights, and peasants alike. All of them were driven by the Pope's promise of heavenly rewards and the forgiveness of sins. The slaughter began before the Crusaders had even left Europe. Among the first victims of the Crusades were the Jews in cities such as Mainz and Speyer, where Jewish life, culture, and faith were an integral part of urban life. Their neighborhoods and shops helped shape the face of those cities. They worked as traders and artisans. In a sense, the period before the Crusades had been a golden age of relatively peaceful coexistence between Jews and Christians in Western Europe. The local rulers protected the individual Jewish communities, which had their own administrative structures the synagogue was the focal point of community life. Synagogues were centers of spiritual life and tradition. But now, during the Crusades, the Jews were targeted as the enemies of Christ, the infidels of Europe. Horrifying pogroms were the result. Thousands of Jews were murdered or committed suicide. It was a prefiguration of the anti-Semitism of centuries to come and it casts a long shadow over European history. In fact, the primary mission of the Crusaders was to remove the other so-called infidels who controlled the territory that housed Christ's tomb. 
In June 1099, after three years, the Christian armies finally reached their destination, Jerusalem. This city was home to some of the most important Christian holy places. In recent years, it had been alternately dominated by various opposing forces under whose rule non-Muslims had often suffered. The Crusaders wanted to reclaim Jerusalem for Christianity. And what followed was a bloody siege with heavy losses. The Christian Crusaders were responsible for the gruesome murders of thousands of Muslims and Jews. They then constructed churches on the ruins of the destroyed mosques and synagogues. Sadly, the First Crusade is only the beginning. The Europeans would pillage and plunder the Holy Land four more times. Jerusalem remains a bone of contention among the three monotheistic world faiths today. For centuries, the Crusades would strain the relationship between East and West and between Muslims and Christians. And then, the pendulum swings in the other direction. In 1453, Constantinople falls to its enemies. The Ottomans strike at the heart of Christianity in the East. The city is plundered. The conquerors advance all the way to the Hagia Sophia, where many residents have sought refuge. There is another bloodbath. But the fall of Constantinople doesn't mean the end of Christianity in the east of Europe. The faith had long since made its way northward, where it found its new center. I'm on my way to the Kiev Monastery of Caves, founded in 1051. It's a place rich in symbolism. The Patriarch of Moscow regularly holds church services here, and I'm attending one today. The piety of the Eastern Orthodox Church is characterized by fixed rituals. The mass, liturgy, and sacraments cannot be changed. These believers rejected the Pope and still do so today. For them, churches are the place where God resides, but nothing more. There is no organ, just voices raised in song. Kiev was the first center of Russian Christianity. It was known as the Jerusalem of the East. Only in the 14th century did Moscow begin to emerge as the religious capital of Orthodox Christendom. Since the era of Emperor Constantine, Byzantium had been the second Rome. After the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans in the 15th century, Moscow was hailed as the third. Trieti Rim, the third Rome, signified not just religious authority, but also imperial power. The Russian rulers called themselves Tsars, Caesars, or emperors. And in this tradition, they were also defenders of the Christian faith. They ruled over the Eastern Church, which defined itself in opposition to the Catholic Church of the West. Both churches continued to vie for supremacy, and the alienation between them has never entirely been overcome. This can also be felt in Ukraine, which lies on the crossroads between Eastern and Central Europe. Orthodoxy dominates in the east of the country, but several million Western Ukrainians view Rome as the center of their faith. And here again, as so often in the history of Europe, we're confronted with the question, is Christianity a unifying bond or a divisive force? And what about Western Christianity? In the 14th century, there are two popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon in southern France. At one point, there are actually three. They're all fighting over the Holy See. They seem more interested in wealth and power than in the salvation of the faithful. Critics increasingly begin to question the medieval order of Western Europe, which is dominated by the emperor and the pope. Many of the faithful abandon the church altogether. In an era of starvation, plague, and discord, a papal church focused only on itself provides little stability or hope for the people.
a new movement begins here in Prague, primarily led by priest and theology professor Jan Hus, who becomes a prominent critic of the old church. Hus is the rector at the renowned Charles University and a highly respected figure. He blasts the clergy in his lectures and sermons, gradually attracting larger and larger crowds of interested followers. He rejects Latin, opting instead to deliver his message in the language of the people, and they're hearing him loud and clear. Now I tell you, our church needs no pope, not at all. Nowhere does the Bible mention him. Our Lord Jesus Christ would lead our faith much better through you. Jan Hus repeatedly denounces the practices of the Papal Church, which he feels are capitalizing on people's fear of hellfire and damnation. The Church promises you salvation for buying letters of indulgence. But all they want is to fill their coffers. Yes, he's right. Here, here is one of them. He's got a coffer right in his hands. There is no longer a distinction between church leaders and secular rulers, Hus argues, just as English theologian John Wycliffe had done before him. Jan Hus's ideas light a spark that burns like a wildfire across Europe. Only God can forgive sins. Hus's critics burn his books in retaliation. The Emperor summons the agitator to Constance. A formal council is called to resolve the schism in the church and silence the heretic. After weeks of interrogation and torture, Jan Hus is subjected to the same fate as his writings. He's burned at the stake. But his ideas live on. St. Peter's Basilica. This colossal structure built in the 16th century is the power of the papal church rendered into stone. But just as they were putting the finishing touches to St. Peter's, the Reformation broke out in Western and Central Europe. The power of the popes was shaken. The Reformation never quite reached Rome, but it did divide the European continent. Martin Luther coined a revolutionary term, the priesthood of all believers. The printing press facilitated the spread of ideas on an industrial scale. Where the reformed religion gained ground, the monopoly of the old church over the interpretation of sacred text was lost. Luther burns the document containing the Pope's official threat of excommunication. He has already drawn up and distributed 95 theses directed mainly against the practice of selling indulgences. This is the spark that ignites the Reformation. Support for Luther among the people is growing. They see him as a champion for their cause. Luther takes a strong stance against an ecclesiastical system that seems to be commercializing the forgiveness of sins, just like Jan Hus a hundred years before him. He says, even councils of bishops can make mistakes. And this is when the split with the Catholic Church comes about. Luther is summoned to the Diet of Worms, where he is told he must renounce his theses. He's chosen a difficult path for himself and everyone involved. In his writings, he questioned the authority of the church and thus destroyed the unity of Christendom. Luther stands his ground, invoking God's protection. God help me. Amen. Luther is placed under imperial ban and declared an outlaw in the empire, but he's granted safe passage. Soldiers escort him back to Wartburg Castle, where the reformer would be extremely productive in the months to come. Luther's theses are now reprinted thousands of times over. The reformers refuse to be silenced. Luther translates the New Testament into German for the people. A broad segment of the European populace is on his side. They can now read the Bible themselves or have it read to them. As Jesus sat near the temple treasury, he watched the people as they dropped in their money. Many rich men dropped in a lot of money. Then a poor widow came along 
and dropped in two little copper coins worth about a penny. One of Luther's early followers is French pastor John Calvin. Persecution of Protestants soon begins in his home country and he flees to Switzerland. Like Luther, he believes that the written word of the Bible is the only thing that matters. He never studied theology, but he continues to refine Luther's ideas in his own way. Calvin is stricter than Luther. He places particular emphasis on values such as thrift and discipline. The protest against the papal church divides the continent, even across national borders. In the Christian West, unity is a thing of the past. During the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, Parisian Protestants are slaughtered on the king's orders. The massacre is a prelude to a wave of murders throughout the country. More than 10,000 people lose their lives. The Catholic kings of France enforce the primacy of their religion with violence. It was the most gruesome conflict the continent had experienced up to that point, and it began in 1618. The Thirty Years' War divided the countries of Europe into fiercely opposed camps. It's no longer about religion, and it hasn't been for some time. It's about power across all denominations. Adherents to the various Christian faiths fight for control of Europe in the name of God. Christians against Christians. It's one of the greatest tragedies the continent has ever seen, surpassed only by the two world wars of the 20th century. This seminal catastrophe of European history, a struggle over religion and power, claimed six million lives. For three decades, Central Europe is a battlefield. Only then do cooler heads prevail. History is made in Westphalia. Around 1645, the representatives of the warring parties make their way to the cities of Osnabrück and Münster to seek a solution to the stalemate. Now it's the diplomats' turn. Nearly all the great powers of Europe are represented here. It's the first pan-European peace conference in history, a year-long experiment with an uncertain outcome. No one wants to be shortchanged, and everyone wants to come away looking good. But reaching a compromise proves difficult. It's a skill they still need to learn. Finally, in May 1648, Delegates from Spain and the Netherlands finally make a breakthrough after three years of negotiations. At Münster City Hall, they are the first to sign the Treaty of Westphalia. The other European powers follow suit in the months to come. Should the madding world not betake itself to peace, a weighty punishment shall it face cries an angel on this flyer from 1646. He's addressing the envoys to the negotiations surrounding the Peace of Westphalia. The angel was expressing the people's most fervent wish. They wanted peace. But how did the delegates who traveled from all over Europe to Münster manage to achieve it? Over there, in the Austrian state archives behind the Hofburg Imperial Palace, is the original Treaty of Westphalia. As so often in European history, numerous compromises were acquired to bring about this peaceful resolution. And here it is, the birth certificate of modern diplomacy. A major war was brought to an end, not by the victory of one of the antagonists, but through negotiation. And here you can see the peace treaty, and at the end of it, the seals and the signatures of the representatives of the signatory powers. France here, here the negotiator, the chief negotiator for the Kaiser, Folmar, 
here, Brandenburg, Saxony, Bamberg, the city of Frankfurt, all of Central Europe is represented here. Deadly enemies became partners in a community of equal nations. It was the beginning of international law as we still know it today, nearly 370 years later. The Peace of Westphalia also marks another important departure, at least in Western Europe. In the years that followed, Europeans would continue to wage wars against one another, but they gradually came to accept that it was best to keep religion and politics separate. <laughs>